I was out of Victory Field this morning with my dog, Russ. Victory Field is where I started playing Pop Warner football. I think I was, what was it then, 11 years old. This is in the early 60s, okay? And it was the Pasadena Bull Pups, which is the Pasadena Bulldogs of Pasadena High School, which is where the Van Halen brothers went to high school. I went to high school at John Muir High School, which was a number of miles away during the busing program. There was a busing program, and they started it in the United States in Pasadena, which they referred to as the Golden Ghetto with fondness because we got a great, big, diverse community before any other community was diverse. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so folks like uh, Jackie Robinson and stuff came from Pasadena, a lot of great faces and all kinds of Spanish speaking, African American, Jewish, everything. You know, there's, it was a collecting, I don't know why. Well, I do know why, but that's a whole nother story, whatever. And in, uh, you know, Pasadena high school was, you know, uh, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, uh, Rolling Stones, Black Sabbath, and my stuff, Jesus, the the whitest thing that I ever heard at the youth club dance uh, was probably the white drummer for Sly and the Family Stone, and now I understand that might have even been a woman. So, <laughs> or maybe they, maybe he's a woman now, and he's on the cover of a better magazine than I am, so I would salute if, in fact, that's the case. It's not the case, but I would salute. <laughs> Anyhow, diversity. diversity. And uh, I played uh, Pop Warner football at its football season. So, you know, apropos what's going on here, as uh, Jesus, you know who reads this script the best is Snoop Doggy. Have you seen Snoop Doggy as he coaches his son through football? And Snoop Doggy has an amazingly su- super connection to Pop Warner football. He sponsors the team and he pays for the pads and he pays for the travel and the bus and so forth. And I got to tell you, how much that means to a kid because I was that kid. Everybody knows what doing laps is, especially if you were in Pop Warner football, but earning those pads was the most, that your whole world revolved around that. There was a point where, a little bit later, where it wasn't so much football, it was more like if I could just get the keys to dad's car, then my life would be solved. It would be complete and solved. You, did you experience something like, okay. And then there were a few other things that, you know, <laughs> That became absolutely imperative. There was a point when I had to have those, th- that jacket. <laughs> For a rock and roll singer, there is that point in your life when you'd have nothing in your pocket except your empty hand. And you got, I got to get those shoes and that girl or that girl in those shoes. That's a good story, too. I'll tell you that story later. Anyway, but how does anybody know that you're playing football? A, unless you walk by in your uniform. <laughs> In a city of sore thumbs, which is, you know, past Southern California in general, how do you stick up? Well, those cleats will help. They make a great sound. They make a clack, clack. It's And that sound is as familiar and as dear to me because I hear it sometimes when the teams, you know, as I'm walking the dog and stuff and the seasons are coming and whether it's football, baseball, those sports have a specific sound. Whether it's the sprinklers getting the fields ready, you understand? Or the kids warming up because the kids all warming up to play soccer football down on the South Pasadena fields early, you know, 7 o'clock on Saturday morning. Spanish is spoken. The smell of breakfast from the trucks is very different. And it's a whole nother world, okay? And the sounds of the cleats as they get out of the cars and the SUVs and everything and make it to the field or as you hear professional teams coming down the tunnels or something. The sound of those cleats on cement or asphalt is as familiar as the sound of the crack of the bats at the beginning of the baseball season. When you hear the, the hardball hit a maple wood bat or oak or whatever it is, that's the sound of history. That's the sound of, okay, start reeling out all your favorite baseball heroes in your favorite baseball games and your scores and feuds, and you, and you will now go slamming across slamming, the trackless time of space in your own hot tub time machine memory thing just from the sound of... That's me imitating the sound of the crack of the bats. We were way ahead of our time. Okay. Combat hippies. All right. And that's what I think of when it starts to become football season.
And I don't mean like on the freeway. That's what you do when you're getting to the gig. And people begin tailgating at Van Halen gigs. I just finished basically a United States tour. We did 50 cities. It was outdoor, you know, underneath the stars with the stars. And geez, I, I think people started arriving for their tailgate festivities two days early. Oh, yeah, because you can set up tents and a lot of these things, like when you go up to Red Rocks in Colorado, you're surrounded by climbing area and skiing area. And people set up tents and make an entire weekend out of it. They bring the campers, etc. And tailgating, and when you talk about football season, I sometimes wonder what, because you'll spend more time in the parking lot than you actually will inside the game, right? Inarguably. And if you add in all prep time and so forth, because that's a big part of the fun. Think about New Year's Eve. Isn't it true that every New Year's Eve, the big warm-up is always better than the final party that you showed up at, okay? I, you, I can see you nodding in agreement, okay? Because, okay, you maybe you, you took a little disco nap. Now you're right over. You can have a little dinner. You hit the microwave. Hey, time to feed the dog. Come here, dog. I'm going to play a little song. You play a little song. You put a little television set. I put on CNN. You're going to watch the folks in, you know, Times Square and so forth. You turn it up a little too loud. Yeah, just celebrate. If it's New Year's, you put the shower on. You forget you put the shower on because now you're changing the music in the CD player, and then, uh, you know, the dog starts barking because the microwave just burns the thing, and you laugh out loud, and it's just great. And that your whole warm-up goes like that. And then the phone rings a few too many times, and you act like you're pissed. And, you know, and, and it's, it's great. That, that warm-up is always way, way better, and you'll spend more time actually doing it than the two to four hours that you will at the actual New Year's Eve party. Agree or disagree? Okay. And I think most people would agree, too, because nothing can add up to your imagination and your expectations, especially if you watch a live, especially if you have Netflix and you read an occasional magazine. You can be pretty imaginative and creative. All you got to do is watch a few hip-hop videos and go, okay, I know how to design a party. <laughs> I know every ingredient I need. Make a list. <laughs> Right? Now go to the Country Channel. Okay, now I'm going to mix those two parties together. And there's an insane guest list, an insane music list, an insane buffet. Nobody even has to learn how to spell buffet. Just serve it up, y'all. Okay? Great. Tailgating is the same thing. It's a way, especially if it turns out to be a dull hockey game or a dull baseball or a dull football game or whatever. At least you had six hours of... Well, with Van Halen fans and friends, you know kind of who you're going to bump into. They are, we are, uh, how shall I term it? Belligerently enthusiastic, optimistic, and ambitious. Or enthusiastically belligerent or belligerent. <laughs> and that applies to everything. We laugh to win. And you don't have to have anything funny in order to laugh. So that's quite, a, that's quite an atmosphere when you get there, whether you bought the, whether you brought the hibachi yourself, guaranteed there's one there. Bring your own contributions of what you're going to get. Bring the music. Bring it, bring your own fine self. And you can help pour the drinks or clean up as we get into the game, okay? California Cooler. You've heard the name. Do you know what the drink actually is? It was one of those pop drinks that you had, geez, was really popular starting, I believe, in the 70s. And again, my memory is really good. What may have happened more frequently than not is that I was fed bad information 10, 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> and that in itself, what I remember, if it's completely wrong, that in itself is fascinating because that completely informs who I am. And maybe I'm... Okay, my mind is exploding. My mind is exploding. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, who cares if I'm accurate? Here's how I remember it. And I can tell you for sure how California Cooler came out because it was one of those pop kind of fruity... Um, Mm, geez, it would. Well, here's how it started. Up in Zuma Beach and up in Malibu, we would get a cooler, just a big plastic campways cooler, okay? And you would rob your parents' liquor cabinet of any clear liquor that you could find gin, vodka, blah, blah, blah. It all goes into the cooler. Then you mix it with fruit juices that you purchased, okay, at the regular liquor store, etc. You put it on the back, your tailgate of the back of a pickup truck, put a folded up beach towel in the back of it so it's at angle, and when you pop the cork on the bottom, that's how you fill up the plastic cups. 
It's called California Cooler because it came out of a thing that said cooler. Camp weighs cooler. <laughs> okay. Nobody heard about this, all right, until folks started using and creating it at the football games, all right, and at the Laker games and, uh, and the Kings games and whatnot. And, of course, all of your Seagram's guys and your Budweiser guys and your liquor, you know, the, the liquor dealer sellers and everybody, you know, whenever there's professional sports, there's a lot of drinking. That's international. And they started noticing what people were drinking in the tailgate parties and stuff. And they, and they bought the rights to it and uh, created California Cooler. And that became a real well-known drink. And that attracted a ton of attention to the idea even of tailgating. This was how it was explained to me. Okay, no, no, you go to there and you get there early and you make California coats and it all reads out as it becomes part of the ritual. This is how I heard it. Okay, 10 million summers ago as a kid coming just as I did. First time I started, t I tailgated was for a UCLA game out at the Coliseum and I think it was 1968. Oh yeah, man. I can, I can tell you, 61 is the new 80 for me. <coughs> hey, at least I got my health going for me. Here you go, here you go, man. Straight out up into the territory, right up to my back. Yeah, I'm just a gigolo, and everywhere I go, people know the part I'm playing. I don't think they know. Pay for every dance, selling each romance. Ooh, what they say. What do they say? What when youth will pass away, no way. what will they say about me? When the it end comes, I know it's the best to do the Life goes on without me. No me. I'm just to do the Lord. Everywhere I go, people know the part it's played. Pay for every dance, selling it for magic. Ooh, what they say. Without me, because People ask me sometimes, what would you actually cook at a tailgate party? Because, you know, a life outdoors and a life on the road. I didn't go to a restaurant for three months on the Van Halen tour here. I did all my own cooking. But you got to know what store has which the best. It's still kind of regional. You know, if you go down south, you can find places that have particular sauces or particular kinds of this or that. You know, I've become a chicken specialist. You know, I, I, I eat what crocodiles eat. I eat, you know, birds and whatever they're living in. <laughs> yeah, I caught a chicken for lunch. It was in a rice patty. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, chicken and rice. Okay, so you learn your way around foraging. The only thing that I can tell, and okay, let's... I'm a little bit of a foodie, but from a technical standpoint, I, I bought Merveld's six volumes and got most of the way through it, frankly, in terms of the new ways that they're cooking, sous vide, you know, and the new techniques of with nitrogen and so forth, and that stuff is not far away. I just bought a can of Stumptown coffee with uh, nitro, nitrous in it, and it's better than just the cold-pressed version of the exact same coffee. So when you talk about nitrogen in a can, and it's highly technical. It's the future, man. You know, we used to depend on Tang because the astronauts drank it, or at least so we were told. <laughs> that may be <laughs> some of that damaged information <laughs> that I've been carrying around for decades, but, you know, I've always maintained that interest from it. Uh, I don't have a trained palate or anything like that. But 
the, I think I do have one foodie move if we're going to be tailgating, okay? Um, having spent time in Japan, get a hibachi. It's smaller. It's easier to handle. It's just a small grill, okay? But it's built for small, okay? Everything in Japan is very compressed and condensed. It's close. You got 2,000 years of neighbors moving in closer and closer. So the stove's got smaller. <laughs> and the way a hibachi is built, it heats up much quicker, holds the heat a lot faster. It'll do what you want, you know? the somersaults and everything that you want that quote unquote uh, coal burning or wood burning stuff. Get bincho time. Bincho time, you buy it in a small bag and it's like four times cooked through briquettes. And if you use some of the bincho time in amongst your coals, it gives everything a real smoky kind of a flavor. You've tasted this on little skewers of yakitori and some of these kinds of meats and chickens and fishes and stuff. It has a really smoky, rich flavor. And that comes from a certain kind of a, a certain kind of wood that has been in charcoal or however they do that and briquetted four times more than usual. It's kind of expensive, but if you're playing games, if you're kind of a foodie or whatever, then that's what you would put in their bin show ton. You can find it, you know, or you can order in the world of internets everywhere. And then we do what I call Icantina tacos, starring Icantina tuna. <laughs> Mojo Dojo, baby. That's where we train, you know, the, the soulful Mojo Dojo. And uh, you take tuna like you would at the uh, sushi bar. Okay, tuna sashimi. Sashimi just means raw. So it's raw uh, tuna, you know, uh, toro, moguro, you know, those Japanese names, you know, whatever. And you just sear it on one side and the other very quickly on the hibachi, just so it's a little kind of burnt on either side. Tuna tataki, it's called. It's fun to say. <laughs> tuna tataki. It sounds like drums. It's very easy to remember. And, you know, it's just a little bit on one side, a little bit on the other, so that the middle is still kind of raw, but it's heated up, okay? Now here's where you make the left hand move, loco. You take tortillas, flour tortillas. And you know how you cook them on the open stove and then just put butter? Cook it on the hibachi with the bench of time to give it that flavor. Okay, flip it, and then use salsa with the tuna, and you got Icantina tuna, Icantina tacos. <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, baby. <laughs> I made up my mind. Big Daddy Diamond I made up my mind. I made up my mind. Don't go away. I made up my mind that you're the girl I want to be mine. Oh, yes. Wiggle eye. I'll listen to my story. I'll listen to the story. Before you send me away. Don't send me away, baby. Please don't be a big baby. Don't be me. Do what I got to say. Cause I made up my mind. Yes, I did. I made up my mind. I made up my mind 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 That you're the girl I want to be mine Yeah! We were just discussing out on the porch Taking a little break from broadcast time David Lee Roth here 
Dot everywhere, all over the place. You can find us. We're very easy here. Watch out for DavidLeRoth.com. Somebody pirated our website, I say with a big smile. It's dangerous seas out there in, in cyberspace. And the subscription ran out and somebody didn't tell us. And a pirate, a cyber pirate, stole my website. DavidLeRoth.com is somebody who took the website and is monetizing. Sounds dangerous. Sounds colorful. I'll take three of them. What the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, so DavidLeRoth.net, dot everywhere, etc., etc. We're very easy to find. And we're talking about football, and we're talking about the season and so forth. We have a song coming up on the football uh, uh, game itself in the Super Bowl. And uh, it's, uh, what company is it? A lot of companies get Van Halen songs because it's more of a mindset than an actual song. Toto is a song. Van Halen is a mindset. It's an attitude. It's larcenous humor. It's what happens after midnight when everybody's guilty. And then it's what happens when adults act like kids and when kids want to act like adults acting like kids. Okay, this could go on for a while, but I know you're still with me here. And uh, we, you got to have range, we were talking about. If you want to continue and have a career longer than the requisite, what is it, three and a half years is probably the average length of a standard career these days. Um, you want to have a career a little bit longer than that, you got to have range. And I would love to say that I carefully engineered this, but I cannot say that. This fell out of heaven into my lap from Jesus, Buddha, and all the rest of the fellas and, and gals. <laughs> and uh, we have a song, a song, a song happening it's you know as we speak for uh the super bowl and then we have a movie about eddie the eagle who i'll tell you about the eagle has landed. you saw the ad for it do you remember the name of the picture it's i will you'll find it anyways it's a hugh jackman movie and uh then we have a uh stoner epic coming up link later okay so the first one is i guess if you're if how would you drive if you're driving with van halen compared to say uh, jimmy buffett <laughs> exactly you'd be driving super bowl style it, uh, the range for that is we have well link later link later i hope i'm pronouncing that the correct way he did slackers he did uh, dazed and confused these are uh, school of rock these are super iconic they're as familiar as my country tis of purple mountains in fact mo more people know the uh, libretto can recite the script from School of Rock or Dazed and Confused. You go, dude, that part where he says, and you can do the whole paragraph more than you know the uh, national anthem. By the way, do you speak Spanish at all? You, you grew up around that area. Do you, you know, uh, who is Jose? They say uh, they, uh, the fella, it's the first word in the national anthem, Jose. And then they ask him, can you, s we'll talk. Anyway, <laughs> I, I did not know that. I did. <laughs> Jose. <laughs> so, I think they were just running the tape recorder. And when they transcribed it, it was supposed to be erased. But they thought, hey, it's, it's, a, it's a lyric. It, it goes, it works. It's, it's the feeling. It's the medium is the message. Jose. See. Can you see if... <laughs> it could have happened. History for all the wrong reasons, like my career. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we got the Super Bowl happening. That paid for the sunglasses. And um, we have uh, Eddie the Eagle. Let's tell the story here. In the 80s, there was a lot of money bouncing around. There was a lot of, there was a lot of um, energy. There was a lot of uh, a lot happening in terms of music, theater, drama, restaurants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And two really interesting left of center sports icons, uh, I'll say, were invented. First, and probably the most uh, memorable, at least to the American audience, would be the Jamaican bobsled team that happened in the mid 80s, okay? And as the story goes, a couple of fellas were on vacation in Jamaica and they saw, I think it's Boxer Day or whatever, when they race soapbox derby style down through the streets of Trenchtown and it's all homemade and there's a lot of spectacular fractures and mayhem and everybody squeals in delight like when the sumo wrestlers come off the doyo and fall into the first three rows and you can show off your broken arm to everybody and get free drinks. And, oh my God, you're kidding. That's how it happened? I wish that happened to me! <laughs> okay. And they said, well, wow, that's like bobsledding. 
wouldn't it be fun or funny or somehow cutesy ass, whatever, to take some money and really put together a Jamaican bobsled team? Immediately, you have a contrast in the humor. There's no snow in Jamaica, et cetera. They have since, of course, made a movie about that cool runnings with John Candy and Leon and a bunch of, you know, it's a great movie. It's on frequently, too. I interviewed the captain and the lead trainer boss of the Jamaican bobsled team on the radio once upon a time, about eight summers and a million years ago. It was no BS. I do not recollect his name, but he was a lieutenant or a colonel, had been trained as British SAS in Hereford, okay? He was no bullshit. And he was recruited to do strength and conditioning and scheduling and everything for the team. So you may have had guys, long lanky guys with dreads on the team, but the guy who was the boss was no bullshit. He was British military. And I interviewed him and they trained like demons. And they pushed shopping carts full of stones and stuff through the sandy beaches, etc. And when they finally got to wherever it was where they competed, um, it was the first time they saw snow. They, <laughs> they qualified dead last. I don't think anybody remembers who won the bobsled competition that year, but you will kill for a Jamaican bobsled team t-shirt today. Everybody, because it represents a mindset. It represents an attitude. They laugh to win. Second, and perhaps even more poignant than the Jamaican bobsled team internationally would be Eddie the Eagle. Eddie the Eagle, as I learned it, and again, you know, if I was fed bad information, that makes it even more interesting, whatever. But Eddie the Eagle was like a carpenter. He was a roofer. He was hands-on fella coming out of working hard uh, uh, England, United Kingdom, and uh, practiced for ski jumping by sliding off the roof of a garage by accident, and it was hilarious good fun, and or something went wrong in his life and he needed a goal. You know, I'm going to swim, swim the English Channel. I'm going to walk across the Gobi. One of those things, you know, a redemptive act that will, you know, reposition me on the spiritual map kind of a thing. And he decided he was going to be a ski jumper and enter the Olympics. And he did. And whenever he came off the ski jump, having had virtually no experience whatsoever skiing, much less ski jumping, he would throw his arms out and splay his legs and look kind of like a great sloppy bird. And they would say, look, he flies like an eagle. It's Eddie the Eagle. And he became another populist hero like the Jamaican bobsled team. Then came the drama because they tried to ban him. And I'm not going to go give away the story or whatever, but Hugh Jackman, okay, plays the part of the coach. That's in the coming attractions and so forth. So I didn't give anything away there. So this is a big time picture. And we got a song happening in there. And uh, that paid for the hat. That paid for the baseball hat. I see you're looking or whatever. As far as stoner epics, <sighs> You know, if they can draw a political cartoon of you and in 82 languages, anything except English, everybody knows who he meant and can imitate you at least in part or full, that's kind of a, a signpost, <laughs> right? It's small, but it's mine. <laughs> everybody wants some. I'm curious as to his translation, the director's translation, like letters translation of what that actually meant to him. Because I'm going to guess he, that, that era was part of his growing up. Van Halen was a 70s band. Our first record was written, recorded, et cetera, during the 70s. I think it came out in 77 and whatever. So we ruled the roost and created a whole lot of bastard children during the 80s. But, you know, we, you know, we were the, the sound. We were the flavor. And uh, then things kind of spun out from there, you know. There, if they say, uh, you know what they say? They say that flattery is the most sincerest form of stealing. And <laughs> there's a whole lot of folks out there that, uh, you know, caught the vibe, you know, what, what Van Halen was doing. But we were the soundtrack. Absolutely. And we always knew we were a soundtrack more than just a series of songs, that it was a bit more of performance theater than just simple recitations of songs, that the show continued backstage under the stage. Allegedly, 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 allegedly. See you at the movies. <laughs>